Hi, this is Justin Coletti. You may know me from Sonic Scoop, but today I am on the Plugin Alliance channel, and we have the privilege of talking to one Mr. Cone Heldens, who is a producer, engineer, mixer, who's worked with a whole variety of platinum-selling artists. He's worked across genres, but he's probably most noted for his work in hip-hop, where he's worked with Luminaries Light, Dr. Dre, Timbaland, Scott Storch, XXX Tentacion, Kanye West, and a whole bunch more. Cone, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Justin. Always a pleasure. Yeah, great to have you here. And the excuse we have is that a Plugin Alliance has just come out with a new plugin from the Amic line, and this is the EQ250, which is modeled after Plugin Alliance founder Dirk Ulrich's own personal Sontec MEP250 EX EQ. These early Sontec parametric EQs released in the early 1970s were some of the first parametric EQs ever available, and they are still coveted today in top mixing and mastering studios. Cohen himself has used these EQs as well as their close cousins, the GML EQ, so he is a perfect person to try this stuff out for us, and he has done a demo and walkthrough with this new EQ250. You can try it out for yourself over at plugin-alliance.com, but today I just want to get Cohen's notes on working with this kind of EQ, why they're important, why they're useful. So Cohen, let's get right into it. Uh, first of all, have you used physical versions of these EQs in the past? I have. I have. So it's truly a great opportunity to, you know, mentally figure out like, okay, what did I like about the analog version and how does the plugin compare to that? Why do you think that these EQs are still so popular? I mean, when they first came out in the early 1970s, they were kind of something that hadn't been seen before, fully parametric EQs with variable bandwidth control. But that's something we kind of take for granted today. Every DAW is going to have a stock EQ plugin that has the features that these kinds of EQs have. So what do you think makes them so popular with major producers and engineers even today? I think they're popular still today is that the quality back in the day was always much higher. And I think because there was, you know, it's a first of its kind. And I think there's so much thought that went into it. And as well as not just like the design itself, but also what kind of, you know, components on the inside do we want to use to get the best possible quality out of the product that we envision. Yeah. So what kinds of applications are you most likely to use this type of EQ on? It's always on my master bus. That's my favorite application for the plugin, uh, just because it has such expensive, rich high end that mm. barely, well, not even barely, it never gets harsh. So you can really mm. push it if needs to be, as well as with the low end, it stays very tight and focused, which is hard to come by in a lot of other, you know, hardware versions as well as software versions. Because a lot of times, especially with the low end, it gets a little bit smeared or it doesn't get as focused and refined as these plugins do. Yeah, you're saying a lot of things that I feel like I've experienced myself and heard from others too in using these EQs, the Sontex in particular, just that they're really forgiving with boosts in the high frequencies and also in the low end that they don't necessarily get overwhelming, overbearing like some other EQs do. So in the demonstration video you did, which you can check out on this channel if you haven't already, we'll make sure to link to that down below where you can hear Cohen using this thing in action. Uh, what kind of tracks did you use it on and what kind of EQ moves were you making? So I used it on the vocals in the demo video as well as the master bus. I focused more on the master bus because I think that's where it truly shines. As we all know, little small movements on the master bus are immense big movements in the auditorium realm. So mm -hmm. I showcased them how little tiny tweaks could tremendously improve the overall quality of a recording. Uh, but I'd like to use it on vocals as well. Just like you already said, it's really forgiving when it comes to boosting highs and lows. And, you know, because it has more than one or two bands, we can also sculpt out some of the mid range or the low mids that might muddy a bit up. Uh, because of whatever vocal uh, recording was made. And I'd love to get a sense for you, just because you do so much mixing these days, what is a small move, a small tweak in an EQ compared to a big one? I do mostly mastering these days, and I know there's a lot of people who just record and they might be really conservative about EQing overall. What kinds of moves are you more likely to make, you know, dB-wise on a vocal compared to, say, on something like a mix bus application? So small moves on a mix bus are, for me, about half a dB. 
one dB to me is already way too drastic. If I have to boost a dB or over on the master bus, it's either because the entire recording was very lo-fi and it needs to be way brighter, I'll give it that. But if it's not that case, then I have to go back in the mix and figure out where I missed something that needs to be addressed. On an individual element in the mix, I can go much bigger movement-wise. So I'd say anywhere between three to even nine, depending on how the recording or the sound itself is. So it really comes down to, on the individual element, I'll go, does this move make it feel better? Or is it taking away from the sound? And then it really comes by, I might go a bit drastic and then be like, okay, instead of that 100% boost that I did, that might be, let's say, 90 dB, let me hone it down and bring it back to like 40%, like maybe turn it down to like a 4 4-ish dB boost or a cut. Right. So it's like, don't be afraid to go a little bit extreme to make sure you're doing the right things and then kind of reel yourself in a little bit. Exactly. It's all To me, it's all about feel. Does it feel better or did it take away? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When you're using something like this on Mixbus or just EQing Mixbus in general, are there certain frequency areas that you commonly find yourself jumping to or certain kinds of cuts or boosts you find yourself making a majority of the time? On the Mixbus, the few regions I always go to frequency-wise is the high end. So maybe 7 or 10 kilohertz, shelve it a little bit. Sometimes I want to bring more urgency to the record itself. So it's more like the, the harsher, around three kilohertz region. Where I'm like, okay, if I do a small move there to bring the record more to the forefront, or I might cut it where I'm like, it's a little bit too harsh. Let me just do a little bell there and remove a little bit around that region to make it less harsh. And sometimes I feel like the record can use a bit more punch. So I might boost around 100 hertz with a bell just a little bit. So it brings out a little bit more body of the record itself. Right. That's a really interesting. Uh, I'm also curious to hear about the difference between when you would use a bell versus a shelf in the low end or high end. Are there any particular things that you're listening for, going for when you go for the bell instead of the shelf in lows or highs? The decision I make in return in regards to the low or the high frequencies or the high EQs over there where I can switch them out for bells and shells. It comes down to, is there something where I just want to do a little region or do I literally want to keep that slope going? Like, let me affect more and go infinite to whatever the frequency ranges that the EQ can handle. So high end, oftentimes I feel more shelving it and the low end, I feel like I'm want to bell it more likely because I don't want to bring up any of the rumble. So it's right. already have addressed the bass, which in, you know, hip hop R&B is always very prominent. So it's already sitting at the edge. I always feel like the edge of like, it's getting too much. It's still in control. If I shelve it, now I get the problem that it not only brings up the punch that's slightly higher in frequency, but also the rumble. So now we might get a problem where we get sustaining notes just jumping all around that were controlled first. So that's why I would probably prefer the bell in the low end versus the bell in the high end. Totally. It is easier to go overboard and bring up unwanted things with a a low shelf than with a high shelf. Uh, This is really interesting. It's great to hear you talk through some of the stuff because it really mirrors a lot of my own thinking about it. Uh, A couple more quick questions for you on this stuff. What about low pass and high pass filters? Do you ever find yourself using those on mix bus or is a high pass filter a big no-no in hip hop because you want to keep all the lows there or is that something that's relevant to you at all on a bus context? What might become a surprise for the low end, I always use a high pass because I want to remove some of the low end. So I always start at 20 hertz, and depending on how much bass data there is, how many low end. I start at 20 hertz, and then I just figure out, is the low end usually the 808 in this scenario? Is that doing too much? If it is, then I might get away by removing even more low end. I had even done it on records where it's all the way up to 40, and people wouldn't notice on any system that there was that much low end removed. High end, I usually keep open-ended, but every once in a while, people want to go for a more vintage feel, more like the old vinyl days. So I have to truncate the high end a little bit so it becomes more uh, low-fi in that regard. 
I totally hear what you're saying, especially on those low cut or high pass filters that uh, sometimes taking away a little bit of extreme low end can actually make the lows feel bigger, more impressive because they get tighter and yeah. it makes you maybe focus a little bit more on the, the audible part of the low frequency. So yeah, some of the biggest bottom you'll ever hear on a record, it's not necessarily because there's a whole bunch of 22 Hertz in it. So yeah. Exactly. Totally and also it's a, as we know, it's a, it's a sustaining note at that point. If you start boosting those lows, it's actually sustaining the note itself that's there. So it's like, no, nah, I'm not here to correct whatever is played. I'm here to make sure that it shines the best possible way. All right, one last question for you on this is pretty much all of the Plugin Alliance plugins add even more to the plugin version of the unit than you could find on the original hardware. In this case, there's input and output gain controls, there's a control for how much harmonic distortion you're adding, and one of the perennial favorites for users are Plugin Alliance plugins, the mono maker for the bottom end and the stereo width control. Do you find yourself using any of those features down below in the extra unit like the TMT, like the mono maker or the stereo width or any of those? I always use the actual features on any of the plugins from Plugin Alliance. Uh, like you said already, the mono maker is amazing. I always like to keep the low end below 60 hertz, completely mono, because we all know a lot of the records are still going to play back in clubs. Clubs usually, you know, it's better to have the low end mono. At times, even if you go to malls and those kind of setups, they're usually playback and mono, so I don't want to get any phasing issues happening with the low end because it was not mono completely. And stereo width too, we're just slightly making it a bit wider so that you can hear all the elements just get a little bit more space around them. So things can become audible a bit more and the mix is a little less dense. But also, for instance, the TMT inside is amazing because the non-linearities that it provides actually gives the mix a density and richness that we always heard on analog equipment. So it's great to just give that a little bit of a drive so that it fills out everything a bit more. Yeah, very cool. All right. Now you have had the ability to both use the analog versions of these EQs in the past. Now you're using the plugin. Any sense on how well it compares? How do you think it stands up to the originals? I think they did a phenomenal job by emulating the analog counterparts. Uh, to me, or at least to my ears, they're very, very identical. And the great thing is we know with plugins, I can save them in the session, close down. If I need to do a recall on another session, pull it up, save it, pull back up the session I was working on, and it will recall exactly the settings I had. Versus as we know, back in analog days, we either need to write it down or take pictures of it and then be like, okay, I have to do the recall later in the day because I need to finish a V1 mix for this. Call that mix up, pick up the notes that you made or the picture, dial it back in. So it's amazing to have it in plugin form so I don't have to do none of that and can just close down the session, open up another session, close that one down again and open up the original session. And then, yeah, with variable knobs like these on this EQ, the knob is almost never in the exact same place when you recall it and it almost never sounds exactly the same. All right, last thing that I think a lot of people are going to ask about. There is the EQ 200 that Plugin Alliance released a little while back, the Amec EQ 200 that's modeled after the GML 8200 style of EQ. Now there's this new one, the EQ 250. It's modeled after the Santec MEP 250 style of EQ. The original hardware units were so similar. So these two plugins are pretty similar. They have very, very similar controls, but people think they sound slightly different from one another. So now there's both for people to choose from. Do you have any thoughts on how to guide people if they were just going to get one, which should they use? The EQ200 or the EQ250? If they have them both in the mega subscription bundle, which one should they pull up? Do you have any thoughts on how these two compare? It's literally a difference of flavor, in my opinion. So I feel that the EQ250 is a lot more richer in sound than the 200 is, for example. So if you're going more for a, I'd say, clinically clean almost uh, processing of whatever you want to apply it to, but still, of course, sound very great, I prefer the EQ200. If I want to add a bit more color to it, I'd like to use the 250. They're both great in their own way. 
Yeah, I think that's a great way of describing it. And similar to what I've encountered, that there's maybe a little bit more precision in the EQ200 and maybe a little bit more of a forgiving sound and slightly more color in the 250. Uh, But they're totally both extremely usable. And if you pull up either of them and do basically the same things, you're probably going to be fairly happy with the results either way. But it is fun to get to nerd out and compare these extremely tiny micro differences. And if you want to hear this EQ in action, both on vocals and on mix bus, definitely check out Cohen's demo and walkthrough right here on the Plug and Alliance channel. I also have a little walkthrough and demo where we compare the 200 and the 250 back to back on some fairly extreme settings, not the kind of subtle settings that Cohen is looking at in his presentation. So if you want to get kind of a guided tour between the differences between these two with some over the top settings, then you can hear that as well. We'll link to both of those in the show notes down below. Before I let you go, Cohen, on the Plug and Lines channel, I always like to get people's picks for what are your top few favorite Plug and Lines plugins that you find yourself using again and again out of the mega subscription bundle? My favorite five go-to plugins in the mega bundle are the SSL 4000, technically also the 9000. It just depends on if I want to go more dirty, more grid. 4000 drums, 9000 on the vocals. Of course, the Amic 250 now. The Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor, which is always a great one. And then what might become a bit out of left field for people, it's the BX Green Screamer. It's a guitar stompbox distortion. It's like pretty much similar to the TS-808 from Ibanez. And I use a parallel on my bass. Mm, And then the uh, MC-77 Compressor, which is an emulation of an 1176 which always works great on vocals. That's always my main go-to. Yeah, that's a beautiful one. That's one of uh, my favorite uh, single compressor plugins from those guys too, especially on vocals. I'm curious to hear just a tiny bit more about this green screamer, tube screamer kind of plugin on bass. Are you doing a parallel thing where you are just taking part of the frequency range of the bass and only distorting part of it? Are you distorting it full band? Uh, How do you approach the parallel distortion on bass? So the parallel distortion I use on the bass is always... uh, it's not the full spectrum. So what I do is I send it out to an auxiliary and on the auxiliary, I high pass everything above 90 Hertz because I don't want to distort the low end because the low end to me, if I distort it, it becomes less focused, a bit too much gritty, but I want to have those upper harmonics be out more. So it's more pronounced on small speakers. So that's why I only distort 90 Hertz and above. So you can dial in a nice tone with it so you can really bring it out in, in the record and literally come at, hear it come to life and to the forefront that way. That's a beautiful approach. I, I can't re- recommend it highly enough. I mean, it's true when you distort low end, you're not always getting the results you want. But a lot of people, when they get first into mixing, they think, oh, I want my bass to be bigger in the mix. Let me just jack up a whole bunch of low frequencies. But what most people end up hearing in the bass is the upper bass and the mid-range and making sure that stuff comes forward and really speaks on smaller systems is what gives you impressive and audible bass everywhere and not just on your big studio monitors. So listen to Colin. He knows what he's talking about. Steal some of his tricks. Colin, thank you so much for stopping by the Plug and Lines channel and letting us steal some of your tricks today. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Definitely check out uh, his work. What are the best places to follow you and find out what's going on with you online? My website, which is mixedbycohenhelens.com or my Instagram, which is instagram.com forward slash or just use the ad handle, which would be at mixedbycohenhelens. Awesome. Well, great to have you here. Always great to hear some of your expertise on this stuff. The best way to hear this stuff is to try it out for yourself, which you can do totally for free over at plugin-alliance.com, where you can try out this or anything else they make for two weeks. Or if you are a subscriber to the Mega Subscription Bundle, this is now just yet another plugin that's added to your Mega Subscription at no additional charge. One of the biggest steals in the world of pro audio, if you ask me, the Mega Subscription Bundle. So try it out if you haven't already. Thanks for joining me. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop, this time on the Plugin Lines channel with Cohen Heldens. Thanks for hanging out with us. See you next time.